Welcome back to our second lecture, uh, which is entitled Taxonomy of Extant Amphibians. Now with this particular lecture, I actually partitioned it or broke it down into two different sections. One is the taxonomy of our extant salamanders, and the second is the taxonomy of our extant anurans. I wanted to split it up to make each of these lectures a little bit more digestible for you. I also want to point out that as we go through and talk about each of these extant amphibian families, we're going to be focusing on morphological characteristics, their habits, their habitat, how they generally reproduce and develop, general diet, uh, their geographic distribution, and whether or not it's present in the status uh, that, it, that it may exist in Indiana. In other words, is it is it numerous, is it common, is it a species of special concern, or is it endangered? And I'll also give you lots of photographs of many of these species that I've taken over the years. I'll, I will iterate though that this is an overview lecture. I really encourage you to read the required textbooks for the class. So the salamanders of Indiana and the frogs and toads of Indiana, read those family accounts as well as each of the species accounts. You will see information regarding the families and the species from those textbooks on our in-class assignments that we have each Friday, as well as the midterm and the final exam. So it really is important that you utilize those salamanders and frogs and toads of Indiana books as resources. So at this point, I'm going to kill my video so that we can have the full screen and allow you to see the various species that we have. But before I do that, let me give you some general characteristics of salamanders. So salamanders are amphibians, so they have smooth skin. Salamanders have really long tails. They have long cylindrical bodies. And most salamanders have two pairs of very well-developed limbs. So they'll have forelimbs as well as hind limbs, but there are exceptions and we'll cover that. The most numerous uh, salamander groups also have this little groove that runs from the nose to the lip and it's called a nasal labial groove. That's where it gets its name, nasal from the nose, labial lip groove. So nasal labial groove on our lungless salamanders, which are the plethodontids. Uh, oftentimes salamanders can be really tricky to differentiate or identify. And so you have to rely on some other features like these costal grooves. So these are vertical grooves on the sides of the bodies. And they're oftentimes enumerated from just be behind the forelimb to just anterior to the hind limb. And the number of those costal grooves can be really important for you to help you identify the different salamanders species that you might encounter. Remember they're amphibians, so they have smooth skin. Lizards have scales. It's not uncommon for me to get a picture from the general public asking me what type of lizard that this particular person has found in their window well or uh, under a log near their house. And the fact that it doesn't have any scales is an indication that it's not a lizard at all. In fact, it's a salamander or at least an amphibian. Now with regard to reproduction in salamanders, most have internal fertilization, but there are two families that have the exception of that rule that we're gonna talk about. Sperm and eggs are stored separately inside the female until the eggs are deposited for those species that have internal fertilization and those eggs are fertilized as they move down the oviduct. In general, uh, most amphibians and salamanders eat worms, insects, and even other salamanders, so they are all carnivorous. They occur almost everywhere except the really, really cold climate, so places like Antarctica or the Arctic. They're very common in North America. In fact, there are more species of salamanders found in North America than any other continent, any other country. Uh, most species live in very cool mountainous forests. Uh, in fact, Indiana has 26 different species of salamanders, so quite the diversity for a Midwestern state. I do want to point out to the salamander family. So we only have 10 recognized families. We don't have all 10 families here in Indiana. Uh, so we're only going to cover the ones we see here. There's 60 genera representing 400 species. So it's not a really speciose group, you know, only four, 450 species, depending on which taxonomy you follow. But what I want you to take away from this cladogram are which of these families are really ancient and which of these families we tend to think are more derived. So if you look at the, the ancient families, we have the family Cyranidae, 
and the family Cryptobranchidae. These are two families that we have in Indiana. These are the most primitive salamander families that we know that exist today. This middle block right here, this is called a polytomy, which this means is we don't know within this grouping whether Proteidae, Amphiumidae, Plethodonidae, or Rachitricidonidae are how they related to one another other than that they are related, but we don't know which of those are more derived and which of those are more primitive. It's not until we start getting the Salamandridae, the Comptidae, and Ambistomatidae, we tend to think that these are the most derived, the Ambistomatidae being the most derived, Sirenidae being the most primitive. So again, I would, I would ask you to reference back to this cladogram. Uh, you will be asked questions throughout the semester about the, the origin in terms of whether it's a primitive or a derived family. And as you start thinking about the natural history characteristics, it just start making sense to you. Some of these characteristics that we're going to talk about for Sirenidae and Cryptobranchidae, perhaps maybe more like fishes than some of our other tetrapods, which means that's a very primitive characteristics. Whereas some of the behavioral characteristics of the reproductive characteristics of Ambisomatidae are very advanced. And so therefore, that's why they might be thought of as the most derived salamander family. So let's launch in and start talking about some of our, our salamander families. And the first is that most primitive family, which is the family Sirenidae. It's a really small group of salamanders that have eel-like, really long, slender bodies. They have small front limbs. This is the family that lacks, completely lacks hind limbs. Okay, so this is the exception to that rule. A pair of front limbs, no hind limbs. It's really important. It's really different from all other salamander families. In terms of habitat, they're fully aquatic. And so this is a pedomorphic salamander. So they have egg, they lay eggs in the water. They have larvae in the water and the adults remain in water. So these adults are pedomorphic in that they also retain larval characteristics. In this case, a fully aquatic environment and they have external gills. So those are larval characteristics, so they're pedomorphic. So back to their habitat, they're fully aquatic. They inhabit really shallow water and swamps, ditches, and ponds. In fact, this is me about 15 years ago, and you can see just how deep the water was in which I was capturing these Western lesser sirens. They're oftentimes nocturnal in their activities and spend the day under cover objects. You can see all the leaf litter in this particular swamp and they hide underneath that leaf litter during the day and they come out and forage for uh, various invertebrates at night. We, we think that sirens have external fertilization, again, which is a really primitive characteristic, much more like fishes than the rest of the salamanders, uh, but we don't know for sure, but it's a presumed external fertilization. And again, in terms of their diet, mostly invertebrates uh, and perhaps even some small fish. In terms of their geographic distribution, they're found throughout uh, Eastern North America. Again, look at the distribution maps in the Salamanders of Indiana book to get a really good idea where you're gonna find these in Indiana. We do have uh, sirens in Indiana. They're not really that common. In fact, they're a species of special concern. And now there's talk at some point to even look at them a little more critically. It wouldn't surprise me in the next five years that unfortunately they, they are becoming endangered species here in Indiana. Their numbers are dwindling. The next species is a species that's very near and dear to my heart. I've actually been working on uh, the hellbender for the last 13 years of my career and it's found in the family Cryptobranchidae. So the Cryptobranchidae are known as our giant salamanders. And you can look at the picture here on the right. This is a fully grown adult. Uh, it's not uncommon for adult hellbenders to reach 25 inches in length and weigh up to five pounds, which is a giant salamander. There's only three species in the family Cryptobranchidae, and it's actually the smallest of the three. The Largest amphibian known to exist today is a Chinese giant salamander, which can be a meter and a half in length and weigh 100 pounds. Uh, second largest amphibian is a Japanese giant salamander. Uh, and then the third is our Eastern hellbender that we have that's actually endemic and found only in North America, particularly along the Appalachian Mountains and portions of the Midwest. It is an endangered species here in Indiana. I suspect if you're in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, you will hear about hellbenders a lot between now and when you graduate. In terms of habitat, they're fully aquatic. So this is another pedomorphic salamander. So the adults live their entire life in water and they have larval characteristics, again, which makes them pedomorphic. So they inhabit these cold, fast moving rivers and streams 
where they generally spend most of their time under hide objects, like a giant slab of rocks or a rock crevice or a log. They hide out there during the day and emerge only at night to forage on their primary food item, which are crayfish. It's a crayfish specialist. Reproduction, uh, males are very territorial and they'll actually make these nests under large flat rocks uh, where the females will visit those males under the rocks. Uh, the females will deposit their eggs and the male will fertilize the eggs externally. So this is the first species we've talked about that has known external fertilization. Most salamanders have internal fertilization, so that makes cryptobranchids a little bit unique. It takes a long time for these eggs and, and salamanders to develop. Uh, from the, the day they're laid, it takes seven years for them to reach sexual maturity, and adults can live over 30 years in the wild, so it's a really long-lived amphibian. Unfortunately, uh, since it's a long-lived amphibian and they're, and they're uh, aquatic species, they are very sensitive to water quality, which is why they're endangered in almost every single state in which they exist, which includes Indiana. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. We'll learn more about hellbenders. I will throw out, if you're interested, uh, as I mentioned, I've been working on hellbenders for 13 years, actually almost 400 hellbenders in captivity in one of my labs off campus. So if anybody in this class is interested in, in visiting and touring that facility and seeing the captive hellbenders that I have, I've got hellbenders that are one-year-old, two-year-old, five-year-old, and seven-year-old. And they range in size from about the size of your pinky all the way up to probably your forearm. So if anybody in this class is interested in taking a tour, just email me uh, at rodw at purdue.edu and I will I'll coordinate with you and my lab manager and we'll give you a tour and let you see some of these hellbenders uh, in captivity. So happy to do that for you if anybody's interested. Moving on, family proteidae. These are also known as our mud puppies. Sometimes they're confused with sirens, but remember sirens have only front limbs. They completely lack hind limbs, so you know it can't be a siren. Oftentimes people will confuse this with a hellbender, but hellbenders have really fleshy folds of skin on the sides of their body, which are highly innervated and vascularized. In fact, that's where how hellbenders get most of their oxygen is through the fleshy folds of skin. And you can see on this mud puppy, there are no fleshy folds or wrinkly skin. So it can't really be a hellbender and they have these external gills. Hellbenders don't have external gills. So mud puppies are pretty unique in that regard. So these general characteristics, they're large elongated bodies, flat heads, really bushy external gills, four well-developed limbs and these vertically flattened paddle-like tails which means that they're fully aquatic. So it's another pedomorphic salamander and they have its rivers, streams and lakes where they remain concealed under rocks and debris, which is again, probably why they're most likely confused with hellbenders, because they inhabit very similar habitats. In terms of reproduction and development, this particular family has internal fertilization, again, which is very different than the siren and the hellbenders, which both have external. This is our first salamander family we're gonna talk about with internal fertilization. Again, I mentioned they're pedomorphic, so they maintain these larval characteristics throughout their lifetime. Things like that paddle-shaped tail, an aquatic lifestyle, and those bushy gills, which makes them pedomorphic. They're found throughout Central and Eastern United States, and as well as Southern Europe as well. In Indiana, we have uh, a common mud puppy, which is a species of special concern. Again, this is another species that's rapidly declining, and I wouldn't be surprised if this one gets on the endangered species list in, in Indiana, at least, in the next decade, unfortunately. Another group of salamanders that are far more common than some of the ones we've just talked about, this is the family Ambistomatidae, which are mole salamanders. These salamanders have stout bodies with sort of thick, robust limbs, thick tails, and a short, blunt head. All have very functional lungs, so these are spend as an adult, largely terrestrial, so they breathe atmospheric oxygen, um, but they do lay eggs in water. And here's some tiger salamander eggs. So this is our tiger salamander. This is a clutch of tiger salamander eggs that were found in Tippecanoe County. You can see these small ephemeral ponds where the adults, the males and females will migrate to these ephemeral ponds during warm uh, rainy nights in the spring, deposit their eggs. The eggs will hatch into these aquatic salamander larvae and they'll stay in this form for about four to six uh, months, and then they'll metamorphose, leave the aquatic environment, and, and take on an adult form where they spend the rest of their time under rocks and logs in the upper uh, 
uh, proportions of a terrestrial setting. But they're called mole salamanders because even as adults, they live underground in small burrows, hence mole salamanders. And as I mentioned earlier, the, in the summer and winter, adults live underground and in the spring, they migrate to these ephemeral ponds to reproduce. And when they, when they reproduce, they're called aggregate pond breeders, which means they might migrate in the hundreds to these ephemeral ponds. So they congregate in very, very large numbers in these ephemeral ponds and pools where they court with one another and lay their eggs and usually just a few short nights. Um, this is actually a species in which I did my PhD on. So I'm very familiar with, with some of the species of amicematis, particularly the tiger salamander. This is a uh, nightly migration that I took a picture in the day as they were migrating to the breeding pond. You can see large numbers of adult tiger salamanders migrating to the pond. And this figures to sort of highlight what I just told you. So if you look at the x-axis, we have the date of immigration. And so we have February 15th to March 17th. On the, on the y-axis on the left, we have the number of immigrants. And on the y-axis on the right, we have the temperature and precipitation. The yellow bars are males. The green bars are females. Blue line represents precipitation. Red line represents uh, the temperature. So what you should be able to deduce from this schematic is that as the spring progresses, we start seeing warmer temperatures on average until early March. And then we start getting these really warm spring rains so we get rains coupled with warm nights, and that's the trigger for migration. So you can see on March 2nd, we had over 80 adult male tiger salamanders start to migrate to the pond. And in each case, each successive day, we still see animals migrating, and we have different pulses with each rainfall event and temperature event. You see these little pulse, significant pulse and minor pulse. So a couple of things you're going to notice is that on average, males outnumber females two to one in these ponds. They're triggered by warm spring rains. And then thirdly, is that it happens over a very brief period of time. So most of this migration and most of this breeding occurs over a four or five day period. Let's move on to the family Plethodontidae, which are lungless salamanders. This represents the largest family of salamanders. In fact, Two thirds of all species of salamanders on the planet belong to this family. All are lungless, whereas we just talked about the Ambisomatidae, they have fully functional lungs, live on land, breathe atmospheric oxygen. The primary mode of respiration with the Plethodontidae are through their moist skin. All Plethodontids tend to be very elongated, really thin bodied compared to the really stout, robust bodies that we just talked about with the Ambisomatids. All species of um, plethodontids have prominent costal grooves. And in fact, you can see the costal grooves on this hemidectylium sputatum or the four coat salamander. You can see those costal grooves here, which again are used for identification. And they have the presence of those nasolabial grooves. So here's the nostril, here's the lip, and there's that small little groove that's running from the nostril to the upper lip. And that's called a nasolabial groove found only in this family. Now, Two-thirds of all variation belongs to this family. So in terms of habits and habitat, they're pretty diverse. So you can have plethodontids that are terrestrial. Some are partly aquatic, some that are fully aquatic. And in fact, you can even have some that are arboreal. In terms of reproduction and development, they all have internal fertilization and the eggs hatch into miniature adults. Whereas when we, when we showed you the type of the ambistomatids where the Adults migrate to these breeding ponds, lay eggs, the eggs hatch in the water, they have larval form, and then they metamorphose into adult. That's called indirect development. Whereas with the plethodontids, they have direct development. And here we have a dusky salamander female guarding her clutch of eggs. You can actually see the pupil of each of the little embryos that are developing inside this egg. So she lays her eggs in a moist environment, and that metamorphosis actually occurs within the egg. So here's the body, here, let me see if I find a good one. Here's the body, the long axis of the body. There's the eye of that developing embryo. This big yellow thing is the yolk sac. And so what's happening is this, this particular embryo is developing in this egg. It's getting all of its nutrition from its yolk sac. When that yolk sac is depleted, this particular larvae will um, transform from having external gills to start 
respiring through the skin and it will bust through this egg capsule and be hatched out as a miniature adult. Again, direct development relative to the indirect development that we just talked about with the ambistomatidae. Finishing up here, talking about the family salamandridae. Um, these are our newts. So the skin is thick and granular rather than smooth that we just talked about with the plethodontids. Now this granular skin is due to the presence of numerous glands that secrete toxins. And we'll talk about those toxins here in a minute. Many species of newts have very bright coloration and that's called aposomatic coloration. And we'll talk more about that in, in some subsequent lectures. But this bright coloration is advertising their toxicity to potential predators. So if you look at this panel A, very, very bright red, that's indicating say, hey, if you try to ingest me, all these spots and in, in, in pieces of granular skin that I have all over my body are producing toxins that are very distasteful and some species, species of newts, if ingested by animals, are actually lethal. With regard to their habits and habitat, they live in forest settings where they take shelter under logs, leaves, rocks, other types of objects. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be as moist uh, as it does to some of the other species of salamanders because of that more granular skin. Reproduction, uh, newts undergo uh, an additional life stage that we haven't really talked about with any of the other salamander families. So here we have an adult salamander, an, an adult newt. They actually spend most of the year in an upland habitat, but then every spring they'll migrate to the water, back to the water and they'll, and they'll actually, uh, that's not true. The adults spend most of their time in the water. They lay their eggs in the water. The eggs hatch into gilled larvae. Those larvae will then have a partial transformation in, in, into these red Fs. So they have an F stage. And this F stage is where it's really, really bright coloration. And this, it's the only terrestrial stage of the newt. And they might be in this red F stage for two or three years after which time they reach sexual maturity, they'll migrate back to the ponds and spend out the rest of their life uh, in those aquatic ponds. If the pond dries, the adults can go back up to land because they still have lungs. They'll go back up to land, uh, but they still stay in moist habitats uh, in their, if they're in the adult stage. But this F stage is highly ter terrestrial. And again, oftentimes can be in habitats that are much drier than any of the other stages of the new life cycle. So again, they have this really interesting eft stage that we haven't talked about before, only found in the family salamandridae. So they also have internal fertilization and, and they require these small woodland ponds for breeding, much like we talked about with the ambistomatids. Diet, newts in all stages feed on small invertebrates, amphibian and fish eggs. Uh, we're they're found primarily throughout Eastern and Western North America, even in Europe, Africa, and Asia. So it's a much broader distribution with this particular family. And this is a, one of the red Fs that I found in Southern Indiana. And as I mentioned, their skin is highly granular and they have these skin glands that produce a tetrodotoxin, which is a non-protein toxin used for chemical defense in newts. And oftentimes what you'll see a lot of amphibians do, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but they have what's called an unken reflex. And this is a posturing, particularly with species that have this aposomatic coloration. And what they're doing is they're advertising their toxicity and, and especially highlighting areas of the body that are really laden with those glandular skin secretions. And so what this newt is doing is holding his tail up saying, if you're gonna try to attack me, first note that I'm bright red, so I'm probably toxic and I'm gonna expose the area of my body that has the most toxins so that you're gonna get a mouthful of tetrodotoxin if you try to attack me. And so this posturing of aposomatic organisms, again, is called an unken reflex. And you see it not only in newts, but some of the frogs that we're gonna talk about here in just a little bit. So that concludes the salamander portion of the taxonomy of extant amphibians. So I'm gonna sign off now and then give you a chance to catch your breath, get a break, read through your Salamanders of Indiana book, uh, and then we'll finish up with the taxonomy of extant amphibians and focus only on frogs and toads. So we'll see you here in a bit.